Hey now, hey now, hey now. It's time for the Pugnologist Pacific Division preview. You know you've been waiting for it, right? I know I've been waiting for it. So let's do it. I've been waiting all summer for this. So, hello, everybody. Hello. Do us a favor. Hit the subscribe button if you would. That would be badass. That would be awesome. So, it's time for the Pacific Division. With me, of course, the one and only Hockey Jerk. All right. So, here's my preview of the division. Three teams are going to make the playoffs. Maybe a fourth team. And the remaining teams will miss the playoffs. Yeah, that's pretty much it. <laughs> I can't say that I disagree with that. So I'm just saying. Uh, anyway, yeah, howdy ho. We decided to uh, do this at the last minute, so to speak. So again, uh, hit the subscribe button if you would. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all the fun places. But it's time to talk about these teams that are going to be in the Pacific Division, at least for the time being. Looking at you, Arizona. But let's start with Anaheim. Oh, this team has problems. <laughs> this team has so many problems. <laughs> so they finished 35-37 and 10. Good for 80 points for the 2018-19 season right now. Looking at 8.5 in cap space. Finished the power play at 24th, 21st on the PK. Great special teams there. 28th in goal differential. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, might have had like the, it was either like the lowest amount of shots taken or like the worst shot percentage in the league. It was, either way, it was bad. And they missed the playoffs for the first time since 2012, finishing sixth in the division, 13th in the conference. Let's talk about who's in and who's out. When it comes to the front office, head coach behind the bench, we got some new names. Dallas Eakin, previous head coach from Edmonton, comes in. A uh, name you might remember, one Daryl Sutter coming in as a coaching consultant, whatever the hell that means, uh, leaving Bob Murray and Randy Carlisle, of course. The big name coming in, Anthony Stollers. What a, that's your big name coming in because, you know, John Gibson might, I don't know, what, have a hangnail, whatever. Uh, Corey Perry leaving, of course, being bought out. Uh, signing with Dallas, yet Anaheim is still on the hook for $6.6 million next season. No other real big names of note. I mean, Andy Walensky leaving on D. But the big name here is John Gibson. We know this. We know that's the way it is. So let's start with that. Jerk, can John Gibson keep them competitive in the early months again and maybe even take it further? Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, you, you look back to this past season. I mean, he was my Vesna Trophy pick uh, by the All-Star break, and Anaheim was already starting to blow it by then. So that kind of gives you an idea of how what he's like as a player. But I, I just think, I still think John Gibson is probably one of the most I don't want to say underrated, but underappreciated goalies in the league. And I think he's just, I think he's just, it's just going to be business as usual. He's going to show up, he's going to stop pucks, and he's going to do his thing. And you can only ask so much of your goaltender. Right? It's going to rely a lot on the team in front of him to score more goals than they did last year, obviously. But yes, to answer your question in a very long way, I do think John Gibson will uh, come back and be a good goalie again this year. I, I think he might even be better with a, competent team in front of him well i think all the competence is up front i mean they got a lot of talent you got raquel you got getzloff still i mean you know I, I guess we can't really say anything about getzloff while we're sitting here talking about how great joe thornton is but <laughs> at advanced age they've still got uh kasha silverberg got some good young talent in troy terry sam Steele. still got adam henrique nick ritchie devin shore another uh uh you know youthful feller so they got some good talent up front it's the blue line jerk that makes me a little bit suspect about where to place this team this season yeah uh i mean how many years has been has the anaheim uh ducks have they been talked about for their blue line you know i mean it was they were a farm for the longest time. Like you can even look at look at defensemen in other organizations who came from Anaheim. You know, obviously Brandon Montour, Shea Theodore, uh, even Jake Gardner. A lot of people forget Jake Gardner was drafted by the Ducks, and 
ultimately the Ducks got finessed, which made them lose him, but they still drafted him. And for the first time in a while, the decor, I mean, the top three is the top three, and it's fantastic. But that bottom three is starting to look a little sus, which is why I think, it's why I think that the Ducks are looking to trade for Justin Falk. Uh, but to my knowledge, there is a major holdup in that, in that Falk doesn't want to sign an extension with the Ducks. But who knows? Th- things will change. But you're right. I think for the first time in a while, the Ducks' defense is the weakness of their team. And the funny thing is, is that we talked about that, oh, they got some decent stuff in the top nine, but we haven't even mentioned the fact that Patrick Eves and Ryan Kessler have been ruled out for the entire season. That's got to say. Yeah. That I mean, Kessler. That one didn't really shock me because the last couple of years he's been struggling with injuries. If I'm if I'm remembering correctly, he had surgery on both of his hips, which I mean I, I've heard having surgery on one hip is bad, let alone two. So uh, that doesn't really come as a surprise. Patrick Eves, though, I thought for sure, you know, he missed uh, the second season, the first full season, but his second season total being on the Ducks, he missed that one, and then he missed last year as well, and. I vaguely remember reading that he was going to be ready to go for this year, but obviously that's the case as he's not even going to get in one game. So it, it makes you wonder if at this point, you know, since he's missing this whole year, he'll have played nine games over the last three seasons. I wouldn't be surprised if he if he hangs them up once his contract's officially over. And as Shakira says, ladies and gentlemen, hips don't lie. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like it's time to move on. <laughs> so we'll go. Well, hold to... on. So all right, what do you got? Well, um, how how much of an impact do you think the youth will bring for the Ducks? Because you and I both agree that if their young guys get going, like there may be something to talk about with this team. I mean, you brought up Sam Steele and uh, and Troy Terry, but let's you know, obviously Daniel Sprong is still a factor there. Max Jones, Max Comtois, who is a player I like. I mean, yeah. that's. Potentially, their bottom five of their six bottom six guys could all be rookies who could potentially tear it up. I mean, it's. I feel like as a shark fan, it should be a little terrifying. Like if all those five of those guys start clicking at once, a little. And obviously, some of them are going to play with Getzlaff. Some of them are going to go play with Henrik, and obviously, but still, like that's a lot of youth that theoretically should all be firing at once. So we'll, we'll see. And consider they had, another name we haven't even mentioned is Delorier. Yeah, yeah. I, but I'm just saying it's like they don't have complete, you know, it's it's not awful. <laughs> oh, no, for what sure. They have in front. It's the back end, as you said, is sus. And uh, <laughs> boy, John Gibson, man, God love you, man. <laughs> you could be, as Joe Namath used to say, struggling. We'll see. He's doing his best. <laughs> okay, let's go down. <laughs> And uh, talk about the Desert Dogs, shall we? For Since they're only here for like, oh, another two seasons. So last year, 39, 35, and 8, good for 86 points. A whopping 178K left in cap space. Uh, I guess the rest of it went to hot dogs for Phil Kessel. Special team power play finished 26 with the PK. Very incredibly awesome, respectable number two. Their their penalty kill was like stupid good. I think, I I think last year they had sixteen shorthanded goals. Yeah, they're, which they're, is ridiculous. That was the one that you like. It, it's so funny how we joke from time to time about the sharks. Like, is there an option to decline the penalty? Uh, but those guys, yeah, their their kill was amazing. It was almost like they got better playing down a man. Mm-hmm. Uh, Goal differential, they finished 19th. They finished 4th in the division, ninth in the conference. Unfortunately, they haven't made the playoffs in seven straight seasons. And the other reason why you're looking at 178 k left in cap space is because they're paying $7.2 million in dead money to Hosa and Ribeiro. I, how is Ribeiro still a thing? Well, you know, when you when you suck and get bought out, uh, you, you tend to linger for a while. <laughs> What is it? It, is it, it, it oh, happens is that to the Barrow. It's lingering. Ew. <laughs> uh, anyway, <laughs> let's you talk know. about the ins and outs of this one. Uh, of course, coming in Phil Kessel, along with Dane Burks in a fourth round pick for 2021 from Pittsburgh. Going out, Alex Galchenyuk, Pierre Oliver Joseph. Yeah, 
uh, I don't know that Phil Kessel is going to bring that much to the party, but uh, we'll talk about it in a second. Carl Soderberg in a deal with Colorado comes in, leaving Kevin uh, Connaughton and a 2020 third round pick. Also leaving Richard Panic, Nick Cousins, Mario Kempe, yada, yada, yada. Who cares about those guys? No, <laughs> I'm a schmuck. It doesn't matter. So the big question is, Will you can talk about Kessel all you want. Will Clayton Keller bounce back? You know, I, I, I think he will. I mean, just looking, he's only 21 years old, right? So it's still obviously a lot of room to grow. Uh, he didn't put up the points that he put up in his rookie season, obviously 65 points back in the 17-18 season compared to only 47 this year. So obviously it was a bit of a slip, no doubt about it. But, you know, the I, I, pretty much everybody slipped on Arizona last year and they were still fourth in the division. So kind of gives you an idea of where that organization is going. But to me, just you think about like the fact that he's so young, right? And he signed the big contract. Like you have a hard time convincing me that he's not – going to bounce back and even exceed the points he scored in his rookie year. I mean, in you know, he did very well at the World Championship too, which is, is kind of like the time for people who struggled to like show they still got it sort of thing. But even then, I mean, we're talking about a guy who's played two full seasons in the NHL. We, you know, still got to let this one percolate a little bit and see where it goes. But I think he's going to be back. No problem. Yeah. I mean, last season, you know, put up – 47 points, a minus 21 the year before, 65 points and a minus 7. We all know plus minus means dick, but there's a little something to be said when you go from a minus 7 to a minus 21. Just saying. But the kid signed an eight-year deal, $57 million. Uh, he's on the clock. The other question here, can Schmaltz stay healthy? I mean, 40 games played last season between Arizona and Chicago. Yeah, uh, same kind of thing as Clayton Keller. I mean, he's only 23 years old. Right. And, and already has had some moderate success in the NHL. I mean, 28 points in his rookie year and then jumping, obviously, up to 52. And uh, last year, he didn't have the greatest start when he was in Chicago. But then coming to Arizona, like exploded right away, you know, putting up he put up 14 points in 17 games. I mean, that's that's a hell of a clip to score at when when you're on a team that wasn't doing as well as they were at the time. And, you know, over an 82 game season, I mean, that's you're looking at almost 80 points when you add Arizona and Chicago's points uh, totals together, obviously. So I, I think same thing as Keller. I don't think there's any reason to believe that he's not going to bounce back. And, you know, he signed the extension. Obviously, he's going to be there for the next seven years. So, uh, you know, use him while you can. Versatile player, can play the wing, can play center. Probably ends up playing center since they brought Kessel in, but still a guy you can throw on the power play and, I I'd be shocked if he had anything less than 60 points considering what line he's going to play on. I remember this time we were going to be shocked when if Mikel Botker had less than 20 goals. But I digress. Well, you know, uh, a broken clock is right twice a day, so. Right now. Uh speaking of broken clocks and twice a day, worst segue ever. Who's your goalie? <laughs> In Arizona. <laughs> It, I I'm I honestly really struggle with this one because on one hand obviously you want to say anti Ranta right I mean he's making the money he was the guy uh, the last two seasons in Arizona unfortunately got hurt last year very early and his whole season ended and then you know enter Darcy Kemper who was really at best was a very serviceable back serviceable backup obviously going back to when he was with Minnesota and when he was with Los Angeles but then he comes in comes into Arizona he started more games than Ranta which is obviously going to happen when your guy gets hurt but 925 save percentage of goals against under two and a half I mean he was a huge reason why they were in the run for the playoffs as long as they were towards the end but I, I don't know, because as as a coach, can you turn your back on the guy who kept your season afloat to go back to the guy who was your starter? I I, I think we'll to start, we'll maybe see a 1A, 1B type of situation, but I still think you have to give you have to give the net to Ranta or at least the edge to Ranta just because it was his net the last two years. And, you know, obviously you you don't control when you get hurt and. I think if anything, it makes it makes the Coyotes and you know Rick Talk and the coaching staff obviously feel good if Ranta goes down again or if Kemper goes down. They have another very capable goalie, and I mean we're seeing now teams are splitting goalies. Why not just go forty-one, forty-one, and see what happens? You know. <laughs> so you think we're going to see kind of a, a Lettinen 
Miami thing that happened to Dallas a few years ago? Except this time it'll actually work, but oh! yes. <laughs> and I don't think it'll cost $11 million either. Uh, no, it will not. According to Cap Friendly, it's only going to cost uh, about 6 So, doing all right for themselves. There you go. All right, so let's uh, leave the Desert Dogs and move up to... Uh... Oh, boy. What, Hockey Jerk's favorite, second favorite jersey? Well, not featured in this photo. <laughs> not I, not that one. We got we to gotta call the graphics department to fix that. <sighs> Bastards. Uh, so, <laughs> you know what happened with the Calgary Flames people. They uh, destroyed the Pacific Division. 50, 25, and 7. Good for 107 points. They still have 7.7 7 left in cap space. Man. That's 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 a lot of uh, a lot of ducats to make some moves. Finished 18th in the power play, 20th in the PK. Goal differential was stellar. Second in the league, first in the division, first in the conference. But then again, Johnny Gaudreau and company kind of disappeared in the first round, and they eventually were bounced in five games to Colorado. So I ask you, uh, is Cam Talbot? The difference. <laughs> uh, he he is the difference, but it's for the wrong reason. Yeah. Uh, they they obviously last year they split the net. Um, you know they split the net with Mike Smith and with David Riddick, and it was fine and it worked for them. But this was the year to give David Riddick the net all the way, and they turned around and they brought in a goalie who's worse than the goalie they had before. I mean. You're probably looking for some insurance, obviously, because David Riddick is still not a proven commodity in spite of how well he played last year. Um, But I I just don't understand it. I mean, they could have easily, you know, they could have rolled with Riddick. And if it didn't work out, you can so easily trade for a backup goalie. I mean, the Sharks probably wouldn't be upset if a team offered them something for Dell or Bebo. So uh, there's obviously options out there. But, you know, you mentioned how much cap space... The Flames have, and it does look like a lot, but no Matthew Kachuk right now. That's a great point. No Matthew Kachuk, but let's talk about some other moves. Again, Cam Talbot coming in, Mike Smith going out. Uh, What might be one of the funniest moves or what should be one of the best ones to watch, of course, is Milan Lucic being traded for real deal James Neal, who was anything but a real deal last season. Uh, I mean, holy hell. Uh, Tanner Glass retired is a bunch of, you know, lower level random names that nobody really gives a damn about. So here's my take on this one. Goudreau, Monaghan, Lindholm, Kachuk, Giordano. Those five guys, those are, those are significant names for Calgary. All of them had career years last season. Hashtag unsustainable. Can any of them top or even match that? Probably Goodrow and Monahan. I mean, they've been studs for years on that team, and and they have an undeniable chemistry together. I think Matt Kachuk too. I mean, Matt Kachuk is only he's twenty one years old. He's the same draft, same hometown as Clayton Keller. Is your tidbit for the night? So, <laughs> I, I I still think there's a ceiling for him. Giordano. I mean, he, he probably won't get better, but. He won't get worse either, at least this year. But the big thing for me is, is Elias Lindholm. Now, like I, for some reason, watched a lot of Flames games this year. And Elias Lindholm was a lot of fun to watch. I mean, he it just seemed like for years the Flames were trying to find someone to play with Monaghan and Goudreau. And they finally found that guy in Elias Lindholm after trying pretty much everybody else, right? Yeah. And were you watching and, a lot of Flames games because you were trying to decide what name you wanted on the back of your jersey? <laughs> it, that may have something to do with it. Nice. Um, but you know, Lindholm puts up seventy-eight points this year, which is a, a Mikhail Bodker season's way better than his last career high. So maybe this was his coming out party, and seventy-point seasons are going to be the norm for him. But he's my regression candidate just because. I mean, he's never really been a bad player, but he's never been a 70-point player either. And I think a lot of that is contributed or attributed to, as you said, Goudreau and Monaghan obviously having career years as well. But, you know, whatever whatever gets the purple Gatorade flowing. I mean, like I said, if he came back with 70 again, wouldn't be surprised at all. But if he hit 49 or 50, 
that wouldn't surprise me either, to be honest. I think that's, of the five names you mentioned, probably the biggest wild card. Yeah, I just, I, I can't see them sustaining that. I just can't. And then to see them get kicked in the teeth in the first round in five games, and Goudreau just was on milk cartons after game one in Alberta. Right. All I was all I was seeing with Goudreau was him just crying that whole series. Yeah. Like just I mean I I'm not a pro hockey player so I'm not going to pretend like I know everything to know but like you're a pro hockey player like get over yourself like put on your pants and go to work. Don't you know stop throwing things and whining to the refs just play. Yeah. It was scotch of whining. Uh last thing for this uh is Lucic for Neil? Is that like just a wash? I mean, last season, Neil, 63 games played for 19 points. Lucic, 79 games played for 20 points. I mean, is it just a case of both guys kind of this, playing the same and just needing a new horizon, a new new scenery on the horizon? No, I to to use a word that you're very fond of, I think in the in that specific trade, I think Calgary got finessed a little bit. Uh, because you go back, you look at the stats, Lucic, his first year with Edmonton was a decent season. I don't, I wouldn't call it a $6 million season, but it was decent. And then the last two years have just been like bad, like bad, bad, bad. And you turn around and you look at James, the real deal, Neil, one not so good season outside of 10 very good seasons. And same thing, like if Neil just falls off the cliff all of a sudden, well, you know what? Edmonton, or I'm sorry, Calgary saw it and they got out when they could, but I, I still think Neil's got something there. I mean, you don't put up almost 30 goals and then all of a sudden you just can't put the puck in the back of the net. You know what I mean? Like, no. I you don't see that sharp of a decline. And so I think you put, like, Neil's also going to get the chance. You know, he thought he was... The piece with Monahan and Gaudreau obviously did not happen. I, I think, I mean, if I'm, uh, who's their coach? If I'm, I can't even think of their coach right now. It's going to come to me. But if I'm, if I'm the Oilers coach, Dave Tippett, thank you. If I'm Dave Tippett, I'm, I'm putting James the Real Deal now. I'm putting him with Connor McDavid. Like, there's, there's no way I'm not doing that. Like, what are we talking about? Dude, we're still talking about Calgary. What are you all? all I know. Already but I'm already on to Edmonton, saying, bro. I know. But I'm just saying, you're asking me if it's a wash. I'm saying no. I say James Neal is going to bounce back. But oh, it's, I see what you're saying. But it sucks for Calgary because they took the worse and more expensive player. Yeah. Yeah. That. Oof. Yeah. I, I wasn't a fan of that deal as, uh, as a closet kind of Calgary rooter. Uh, <laughs> so. Let's move on. Uh, we're just going to go a little bit, a scotch away from Calgary to go to Edmonton. This is a team, oy, oy, oy. Uh, they just, they're, they are, they might be the most perplexing, confusing team in the Pacific Division. Last season, 35, 38, and 9 for 79 points. Right now, two point four million left in cap space. Not a whole lot of wiggle room, but about the same as the Sharks. Finished twenty fourth on the power play, thirtieth on the PK. They got torched, ladies and gentlemen. Twenty fourth <laughs> in goal differ or er, uh, goals against differential. Excuse me. Finished seventh in the division, fourteenth in the conference. And let's also not forget, McDavid tore his PCL and his left knee in the season finale. You don't come from that. You, know, you don't come back from that like really fast. We'll see. Let's talk about the ins and outs uh, coming in. As Jerk mentioned, head coach Dave Tippett, also GM Ken Holland coming in from Detroit, leaving finally Peter Chiarelli, who seemed to out. I don't understand how he lasted there that long, to be <laughs> honest with you. Uh, Hitchcock, of course, leaves after replacing T Mac, Todd McClellan. Uh, for the players, of course, coming in, James Neal, as we already talked about, Mike Smith, a player we already spoke about, Marcus Granlin, played in Vancouver last season, leaving, of course, Lou Cheech, as we said, Andre Sakara, uh, Tobias Reeder, Ty Ratty. So you do have a couple pieces that we're leaving. So I'll start with this one, Jerk. Uh, does McDavid begin the season? 
I think he does. I mean, when you're missing the playoffs, your recovery starts in April. And he's had five, almost six months. Now, I'm not going to, you know, uh, I know an MCL, ACL tear, that takes, you know, six to 12 months to get handled. I don't know about a PCL. I can't speak for that. But I, I, I still think he's, I mean, that dude is a freak. Like, his... Like, with his injured leg, he probably skates faster than most of the guys in the league. (laughs) And I I, I just think with all the time he's had to recover, obviously, I think he will come back, uh, you know, ready to go for the season. And can I just say really quick, I'm amazed. Because you mentioned earlier how this team is just, like, was all sorts of bad last year. I'm amazed that a team who had two guys who scored over 100 points missed the playoffs. That's just unreal to me. Well, that's where I sit with Edmonton. It's the fact that they're just so reliant on McDavid, Dreisaitl, and uh, you, I mean, dear Lord, their cap is just, uh, I don't even want to get into it, but they have so much money tied up in a couple players, and if either one of them goes down, you know, and which was... Kind of my take on the Eric Carlson deal is that, man, that is, that's a lot of money to be paying that blue line in San Jose, which, you know, we'll get to later. But, yeah, I, I look at that and I just go, I don't know. Let me ask you this, though. Uh, to, uh, stop me if you've heard this before, jerk. Um, who's your goalie? <laughs> <laughs> we going Koskinen? We going Smith? Uh, this one, I think, is a true true platoon i mean obviously koskinen is making more money than smith but smith has more nhl experience i'm i don't know i i i think it i think a lot of this goes back to um like you said earlier how did peter shirelli last as long as he did in edmonton i think i think if the oilers fired peter shirelli when uh before when they were supposed to koskinen's probably not on this team this year He's probably an unrestricted free agent or he goes back to Finland. But because Shirelli stuck around as long as he did, Koskinen is now re-signed for three more seasons. And it's fine. He's a goalie. He owns a helmet. He can play. But he's not a starter. And Mike Smith is 100 years old. So as good as he was last year, I don't know if he can bring that back. So... (sighs) All I'm saying is McDavid and Drysaddle might need to score 200 points this year. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Uh, let me ask you this, though. We talked about the amount, the staggering amount of money that is afforded to just a handful, a sketch, a couple of players. But Bakersfield, their affiliate, finished first in the AHL. If we get another bad start from Edmonton, you think we see some early call-ups? Yeah, that wouldn't surprise me, honestly. I mean, there's already you've already got guys from last year or uh, who weren't on the team last year that have made an impact early on. I mean, uh, Joachim Nygaard, obviously, Colby Cave. These you know these guys who are on the roster right now, Joel Pearson, as well. They've made an impact early on, and even in the system, you know, they've they've got a guy like Kaylor Yamamoto. They've got a guy like Ryan McLeod. I mean, these are guys who were still drafted not that long ago. So obviously, you don't want to rush them up to the show. So soon, I think Evan Bouchard, who was drafted in 2018, I think maybe he's the one guy who does get the call up to the NHL. But I don't know. I mean, I, I'm inclined to agree with you. Some guys may get called up, shuffled around, especially with the new regime there in Ken Holland and Dave Tippett. But again, it's a matter of who are you going to call up because it's the grass isn't always greener on the other side. <laughs> wow. Oh. I was going or, to make a very in in, Go ahead. in in Edmonton. I was going to say the oil is not always darker on the other side, or the snow is not always whiter, or you know. Why is it got to be white? I, I didn't say it. You did. All right. I'm just saying. <laughs> uh, so, oh, I feel like we need to move on quickly. Uh, L.A. Let's talk about uh, the, let's talk about sure, these freaking you, guys. You you made a mistake on your graphic. It's not L O S. It's L O L. <laughs> I'll give you that one. 
All right. Uh, L.A. absolutely shit the bed, people. There's no sugarcoating this one. 31, 42, and 9 for 71 points. Right now, as it stands, 8.7 million in cap space. I don't know what the hell they're going to do with that. They finished 27th on the power play, 29th in the penalty kill, 31st, bottom of the barrel in goal against differential. Finished 8th in the division, again, bottom. Finished 15th in the conference, worst season since 07-08. It was a tire fire in L.A., people. So let's get to the ins and outs. Coming in, uh, you might have heard of these people. New coaches, Todd McClellan, Trent Yanni. You might have heard of them. I'm just saying. Uh, do you believe that there is a former shark behind the bench as well by the name of Marco Sturm? Is that correct? Uh, yes, there is. Uh, he was my candidate to be the head coach and didn't happen. But yeah, after I, what he did for Team Germany, I'm a little surprised by that. Yeah, I, I, I still think I'm glad that they kept him behind the bench, though, because you know, Willie Desjardins time there was such a disaster and I could very easily have seen Sturm take some heat for that, but they kept him behind the bench, which is good. No, wait a minute. When you're talking about Willie D being a disaster, do you mean with LA or Vancouver? Yes. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) So (laughs) Willie D leaving John Stevens leaving after an incredible 13 game run. (laughs) Just everything. They just burned the bench down. They just, Throw gasoline, tire fire, no biggie. Uh, coming in, wow, what an amazing a, amazing additions the LA Kings have made this season. Brett Sutter, sure. Mario <laughs> Kempe, well, hey, at least he gets to play with his brother Adrian now, so good on you. Martin Frick, and uh, this really shitty defenseman named Yoakam Ryan. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> I know. I'm having fun with it, but the guy scored an own goal the other night. All right? Uh, leaving Dion Phaneuf, who was uh, waived for the purposes of a contract buyout. Uh, and that's pretty much it. The other names going out are no one knows, neither cares. So we have our three questions, and I will start with this one. It is Ilya Kovalchuk done? I mean... When we talked to Drew Remenda about him coming back about a year ago, he said that he was not surprised that Kovalchuk was bad and should feel bad. Can he come back? I, I, I think so. I mean... Wow, real... Uh, yeah. A massive amount of confidence behind that, but go ahead. Well, I, I he, you're right. He had a bad season. Everybody a bad season. Like, bad and they should feel bad, but... He still put up 34 points in 64 games. That's that's not, you know, that's not what should be expected uh, of a guy who is making six and a quarter million dollars a season. However, he w- had a bad season and he still scored at half a point per game. I want to know what a good season looks like. Oh, hi yo. And also, like I said earlier, with Clayton Keller, had a very good showing at the World Championship. So there's still something there, obviously. But also a big factor, Willie Desjardins did not know how to use Ilya Kovalchuk at all. Like, he just scratched him and put him on the fourth line. And it's like, it's the same thing that we talked about. I mean, obviously, Chris Tierney and Ilya Kovalchuk are two very different players. But the thing about Chris Tierney was it's like, he's not scoring because he's not playing with good players. It's the same thing. You know, Ilya Kovalchuk is supposed to be net in goals, but you can't score if nobody's getting you the puck. And... And I, I think what Jeff Carter is going to get him the puck if he's healthy. Uh, I I just think I think Todd McClellan. I mean, I, there are a lot of things about Todd McClellan that I'm not a fan of, but I think Todd McClellan knows how to use Ilya Kovalchuk. I mean, he's seen him firsthand. He knows what kind of player he is. I, I think he will bounce back. I don't think it's going to be 80 point seasons, but I think 60 is a fair point. I mean, he'll probably be a you know, if everything goes according to plan, maybe a 25, 35 guy. And he's going to be playing with Kopitar, who's good. Dustin Brown's career has rebounded ever since Daryl Sutter left, which I feel like everybody could have pinpointed that one. But anyways, like, yeah. I still think there's something there. And I don't know. This team, the thing that makes me nervous about this team is you're right. They're probably going to be a dumpster again this year. But the guy 
who's waiting to hear his name called at number one is the best player in a long time. And I am really worried that he's going to end up on LA and torch the sharks five times a year. Yeah, but not this season. Well, no, of course not. Because the sharks, are, the, the sharks are going to win the cup this year, right? Well, of course. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But for LA, you got to feel like literally the thing that they're most excited for is getting a new Jersey. Hey, that Jersey is sick though. It's a good looking Jersey. It would be nice if they, uh, you know, I don't know, found a, a you know a different color other than white, black, silver, or gray in the crayon box. I'm just saying. But I mean, there's a couple pieces. Obviously, Kopitar, but boy, I don't know, man. Kopitar, ever since he signed the big deal a couple seasons ago, just is kind of, you know, whatever. Uh, you know, we're still talking about a team that has an aging Dustin Brown. Uh, I, I'm a Tyler Toffoli fan. I like his game, but. Mm-hmm. You know, remains to be seen. And then you look at the other names on this team, and it's like, aside from Drew Doughty, I mean, really, and then Jonathan Quick, can we talk about that for a minute? I mean, he's getting $5.8 million for the next four years. Jack Campbell and Cal Peterson in net were better than Quick last season. And let me say this again. Jonathan Quick is signed for another four years. Yeah, well... Mm, so, there were rumors that Jonathan Quick was going to be traded to Columbus this year, this summer rather. I could still see that, but <laughs> you're right. Quick's, I mean, you think Columbus wants to pay, you know, a, a goalie on his last legs almost six mil? I mean, I would honestly, think LA is going to like absorb some of that salary. Honestly, better than. Better than the goalies Columbus has now, but oh damn, this is not a metropolitan division preview. Yeah. So what's Steve Mason up to? <laughs> <laughs> I you you mentioned Kopitar and Dustin Brown, and and I I with Kopitar, you and I have gone back and forth on this for about a couple of years now, and you you look at the seasons Kopitar had the first year of that big deal, and then last year. Uh, first year was horrible. The first year, yeah, fifty-two points, which I mean, I think any I would be happy to score fifty-two points in a season. But if I'm making ten and a half million dollars, more is expected. And then the fault, fault comes back, ninety-two points, and everything's great. It's all you know, bubble gum and ice cream, and it's perfect. And then it comes back with sixty points. Now, again, I still think he's a hell of a player. And he's probably going to, he's more of a 92 point guy than a 60 point guy. I still believe that. But you have to wonder with this flip flopping that's now happened the last three seasons, it makes you wonder how long is this going to go on? Like, where is it going to go? Is he going to establish himself as that 92 point guy that I think he is? Or is he just going to keep floating between 50 and 65? And, you know, that's just going to be it. He's going to be the personification of his team. And as for Dustin Brown, I think the biggest wonder for Dustin Brown's career was Daryl Sutter getting fired, believe it or not, because you you just look back at the stats. Dustin Brown's a good player. Daryl Sutter gets hired and Dustin Brown sucks. Mm -hmm. Then Daryl Sutter gets fired and Dustin Brown is all of a sudden a good player again. I mean, I don't think there's any kind of advanced analytic for that. But (laughs) if there is, Chris JWS would find it. Yeah, but I'm just saying, like, I. I get it. We're Sharks fans, and Dustin Brown is the worst thing ever, but I still think it's a very decent piece for L.A., and and I think L.A., they're definitely way further into the landfill than Anaheim is, but I think if L.A. can get things to fall right for them, maybe guys like Kempe and Toffoli can get their heads screwed on straight. L.A. might uh, they might push for that fifth-place spot. I'm not sure. Ooh. It's It's really tough. I don't know. I still got him in the basement, man. I just don't know what it, – it'll be interesting to see what T-Mac can do with the oldest forward group in the Pacific Division. Again, we talk about Kopitar. Well, he's done that before with the Sharks. I know, but uh, I don't know. I feel like the Sharks are a bit more talented overall. Kopitar is 32. He signed through 23-24. Doughty, 29, but he signed through 25-26. Now, I know as a Sharks fan, I have zero room to talk about an extended contract for a defenseman. And then Jonathan Quick, 
33 right now, still signed for the next four seasons. I don't know how that's going to work out, especially when you got Jack Campbell, Cal Peterson breathing down your neck. Uh, like you said, Columbus, you're on the clock, I suppose. <laughs> I, 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 I'm just very interested. Like, I don't know. I, I think the new coach with Todd McCullen coming in. I mean, I, I, I think it'll work out. I mean, if you remember back to 2014. Todd McClellan helped L.A. win the Stanley Cup this year, so he's already has experience with that team. So I, I think there could be something there. Fucked up, man. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's go to uh, Eric's favorite town, Vancouver. Vancouver. Now this how we, yeah. Van- oh, yeah, I like it that you pronounce it kind of like Manteca, Vancouver. <laughs> I like it much better than uh, the way uh, Puck Guy says it. So anyway, the Canucks finished at 35-36 and 11, good for 81 points. After Brock Besser recently signed, the cap space is now set at zero. Somebody is going to be leaving that team pretty goddamn quick. <laughs> <laughs> They finished with power play at 22, the PK at 11. Their goal differential was finishing 22nd in the league, finished 5th in their division, 12th in the conference, and here is the stuff that gets you. They have averaged the NHL worst 2.44 goals per game over the last four years, and they've finished 25th or lower in goals four in the last four seasons, of course, missing the playoffs each time. Uh, Boy, uh, it just, I don't know if it's a curse that once you're swept by the Sharks in the playoffs that your team just goes right down the dumpster, but uh, that's where it is right now. I'm just saying. Um, yeah, I mean, the, you think about it, the Sharks kind of broke Vancouver a little bit. I mean, swept them out, as you alluded to earlier, and then from there, they just they haven't done anything. I mean, they made the playoffs, uh, I want to say they made the playoffs at least once. Yeah, once. And yeah, it didn't really go well. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. I just, uh, oh, I just, they, I hope they, they blame everything that bad that happens this season on Nikolai Goldold. <laughs> <laughs> just to be that guy. Um, let's get into the ins and outs. Coming in, uh, Tyler Myers on defense. JT Miller coming in from Tampa Bay. Uh, Michael Furland, Jordy Ben, Oscar Fantenberg, going out Ryan Spooner, uh, Marcus Grandlin, Derek uh, Pouliot. Am I pronouncing that right? Uh, I've heard Pouliot, but sure, we'll go with it. There you go. I like. I kind of like it saying "pull it out." Anyway, uh, Luke <laughs> Shen. Uh, we we might have already went after after dark with that comment. Uh, so anyway. Uh, uh, when do we start Quinn Hughes? <laughs> uh, well, uh, um, let's see. It's September, so about four and a half months ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, you know what? Homeboy came in and played, uh, how many games? Let's see. How many games did he play last year? He played five games with the Canucks and had three assists, but was immediately their best defenseman. Yeah. Uh, Quinn Hughes is, is a stud, uh, easily... You could wear an A coming up. I mean, he's that kind of guy. As young as he is, you know, he's 19 years old. He's already a professional, already their best defenseman. Play him. If Vancouver wants to win, they're probably going to have to play him 30 minutes a night, which, I mean, you know, he's a kid. He can do it. Yeah. I I don't know. It's going to be a tough road to hoe, my friend. This team not unlike Anaheim for me in that they have mm-hmm. a decent amount of talent up front in that top nine, but the back end is sus, as you like to say. I'm mean, going to be my <laughs> new thing, by the way. <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> but, I mean, you're talking about a team that has Pedersen, Besser. Uh, I mean, we talked about Hughes, but uh, Bo Horvat, Tanner Pearson, Jake Bertetta, uh Antoine Roussel, who's a guy that I actually kind of like as a you know bottom six guy. Uh, but the defense... Alex Edler, I'm surprised that this guy is still in the league, to be quite honest with you. Uh, <laughs> Chris Tanev has never, you know, lo- lit the world on fire. I mean, is Jordy Ben going to be a difference maker? Remains to be seen along with Tyler Myers. So, uh, 
Then it comes down to Jacob Markstrom and Thatcher Demko in net. And I, right now, I think it's it's Markstrom's to lose, but Demko's got to be breathing down his neck. Easily. I mean, a lot a lot of people saying outside outside of Carter Hart, a lot of people are saying Thatcher Demko is the best goalie not in the end, a best North American goalie not in the NHL last year. And I think. I think internally the Canucks want Demko to push Markstrom and maybe take the job away from him. But I, I I think Markstrom is also somebody where I feel like every time the Sharks play him, they light him up. But yeah. when he's not playing the Sharks, I feel like he's gotten better or at least stayed steady every year. And <laughs> Hey, Columbus. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, pending UFA, who knows? But That's what I, I'm, I'm saying is that, you know, Markstrom's on the final year of his deal where, you know, Demko has two, so... Yeah, and even then, if Demko, you know, Demko doesn't work out, they got Michael DiPietro waiting in the wings, who famously was torched by the Sharks last year, but is still overall a very good goalie prospect. The thing that stands out to me, I like your point where you said the defense is, you're right, it's definitely going to rely heavily on Quinn Hughes. Obviously, Tanev, Stetcher, Myers, Edler, Ben, it's, it's a very decent defense core. Like, I would place all of those guys in the middle pair, and I think you'll be okay. But outside of Quinn Hughes, I don't know that I would want any of those guys logging anywhere like 22 to 27 minutes a night. Um, <laughs> so that's just me. But the the glaring thing for me, I mean, Jesus, they've got 16 NHL forwards right now. Like like you said, somebody is leaving. Yeah. A- and uh, I don't even know what to make of this. I mean. And somehow <laughs> Goldobin got a one-year extension. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. There's so many guys on this team, and and I think I don't even know what to think. Like I I'm looking thinking back to last summer. It's like why are you bringing in Roussel and Beagle when you've got eighty thousand other guys who can play forward? You know, and mm-hmm. I'm looking on, of these sixteen forwards, only one of them doesn't have to go through waivers, and it's Elias Pettersson, who's not going to the AHL. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> So Vancouver's got to figure it out. Now, I, I I wouldn't be surprised if they still want to trade Louis Erickson. Um, I've heard there's question marks about Zven Berchi, but as far as I know, he's good to go, which Zven Berchi's always been a player that I've really liked. He's never cracked more than 40 points, but I just think he's a guy who works really hard and could probably be a 20, you know, a 20, 25 goal guy if given the ice time. And I, I'm looking as many forwards as they have that they need to get rid of for sure. Like, I think because of how the forwards they have, just how good top to bottom they are. I I think Vancouver, they if Arizona and Calgary take a dump, I think Vancouver could somehow slither their way into the playoffs. Oh, I don't know. I just feel like that the the defense and the goaltending situation is too sus. Um, <laughs> so I don't know about that. I mean, you know, you mentioned Sven Berchi. We hadn't even mentioned about him. We haven't even mentioned Josh Olivo. Uh, it just, if you remember back that when we talked about the Vegas Golden Knights, their first season, it was a lot of talk of, well, they don't have a top line, a second line, a third line, a fourth line. They have four second lines. Mm -hmm. And I feel like Vancouver has four third lines right now, (laughs) or (laughs) or it's like they have one top line, you know, with Pedersen and Horvat and Besser. And then the rest is all third and below. I don't know. It's going to be tough. Uh, Goldobin, God love you, man. One year extension. This is your last chance, kid. Like, stop. Get off social media. Put the yes. tanner away. <laughs> get away from the beach and get your ass in a gym. Yeah. Stop Instagram living with your jewel and play hockey. Right. That's all I'm saying. And I, I, I think other, you're gonna. Sorry. Go ahead. Well, I was just gonna say the other thing of note here too. With uh, which is very different from a lot of the teams in the Pacific. There's no contract on the books that is longer for four years other than Tyler Myers. Uh, although when I had my notes written down, this is before Besser had signed. So which, ugh, that guy is Besser's going to get the farm when that contract is up. Well, okay. I'm so glad you said that because this is what I wanted to talk about. Roberto Luongo still getting three million a year for the next three years, according <laughs> to Cap Friendly. What happens in two seasons when Pedersen and Hughes are going to be up for the coin? Oh, yeah, that's 
yeah, it's going to be tough. I mean, they're going to have, I'm, uh, assuming the cap doesn't go up by that point, which obviously it will, they, they're going to have $40 million in space to get all these guys, you know, Pedersen and Hughes locked up, and obviously Troy Stetcher and Demko will need to come up as well. So they're going to have the space. <laughs> they're going to have the space, but you're right. Even in two years, like, they're still going to have a lot of players. I mean, Jake Vertanen is a guy who's still, you know, somebody also from that 2014 draft like Goldobin who m- might be on his last chance. Of course, I think with Vertanen he has gotten better every year, but I still think he needs to show more. And obviously Tyler Mott, you know, guy they got from Columbus, he's a piece I know that they're very interested in. But I, the what we're going to see with the Canucks, honestly, is if I'm that coach, you know, if I'm Travis Green, I'm going to my whiteboard and I'm just writing – you know, Pedersen, Horvat, Sutter, and whoever their fourth line center is. And then literally pull a name out of the hat and you fill in your wingers. But because they got so many damn forwards on this team. Like even like you said, even with those guys coming off the books in two years in time for Pedersen and Quinn Hughes to sign, they still can have so many freaking dudes on this team. Yeah. It's uh, uh. Man, I'm telling San Jose really broke them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so let's move down to Sin City, kids. Uh, the team you love to hate, the Vegas Golden Knights. We know what happened. 43, 32, and 7 for 93 points. Right now, they are stuck at a cool mill left in cap space. Finished 25th on the power play, 14 on the PK. That number does go down when you incorporate a five-minute major. Uh, They finished 14th in goal differential, third in the division, seventh in the conference, finished second in the NHL in shots per game, and finished second in the NHL in hits per game. Now, I should digress here. (laughs) Yes, second in the NHL shots per game. I'll give you that, and yes, they do get a lot of rubber on the net. But finishing second in the NHL in hits per game, let's also just take into account there's a lot of home cooking with the hit counter <laughs> in Vegas. Let me tell you, there was a, if I remember correctly, there was a playoff game. The Golden Knights were credited with 80 hits in the game. Okay? Just saying. Don't, don't, that might be fake news, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> I don't know. So let's get to the ins and outs. Uh, coming in, no one, nothing, nada. <laughs> <laughs> really. Uh, leaving Colin Miller on defense, who went to Buffalo for a second-round pick and a fifth-round pick. There's one thing Vegas knows how to do. It's like compile picks. Uh, Eric Holla goes to Carolina for prospect Nicholas Roy and a conditional fifth-round pick. Ryan Carpenter, former Shark. Free agent left, went to Chicago. Uh, Belmar went to Colorado. Uh, that, that was a free agent as well. Uh, Mikhail uh, Grabowski, he retired. I don't think anybody's going to miss him. But the big one, Nikita Gusev, who we heard about all like as the playoffs. With, when the Sharks were playing Vegas, there was speculation that Gusev might get into that series. And then you had all summer to try to get your shit together. You're not able to do it. So you flip them to to Jersey for a third-round pick in 2020 and a second-round pick in 2021. And I don't know about you, Jerk, but I've I've been seeing a a lot of very happy fans in New Jersey watching this guy. So I'll I'll say this. If Vegas had played Gusev in that playoff series, they would have won in five. I'm telling you that right now. damn. But... Well, because they signed him when they were up three games to one. So, yeah. but uh, yeah, New New Jersey's over the moon. I mean, this guy's a stud. He's the best player in the KHL the last two years. He scored a lot of points at the Olympics, at the World Championship, in the KHL. I mean, all he does is score. Everything he's, he touches goes in. He scores, but goddamn, he's little. He's only five nine. Yeah, well, you know, you watch the NHL. Well, you the watch thing, the though, NHL. You know that he's like the anti. Uh, Goldobin, because Goldobin, tan, good-looking kid. Have you seen a good shot of Gusev? Dude, he's a goofy-looking motherfucker. <laughs> well, you know, six or five nine is the new six foot in the NHL, and <laughs> I, I, I think Jersey's obviously 
Jersey's going to love him, but you know what? That That's the man right there, Mark Stone. I mean, just put the C on him right now, honestly. I uh, like, can't believe it hasn't already been there. Yeah. Uh, ew. Well, there's a push for, you know, March or so, but... I don't even want to talk about him. I'm such a baby. Anyways, uh, yeah, you know what? I'll be honest, though. This team... They're my pick to win the Pacific Division, unfortunately. Uh, I feel gross for saying that. I need to take a shower. But, like, the this we have uh, – it's obviously not – you know, we have written down here in our little note section just the lines that NHL.com thinks the Vegas Golden Knights are going to roll out. And they don't even include Cody Glass, who I think is going to make the NHL. I mean, dude's a stud. And so you mix Cody Glass in with that lineup, which already has a very good top six. I mean, they – This is This is my point. Is there a better top nine in the Pacific than Vegas? Um, uh, no, yeah. no. I'm gonna go That's with no. My point. And I, I think other teams have. I, I think the Sharks for sure have better defense. Oh, and I, I, I think goaltending. You flip a coin, but sure, you're right. The offense, hundred percent. Vegas is the best offense there. I mean, and here's. Here's the thing about Vegas's offense that mm-hmm. scares the shit out of me. If the Sharks had retained Pavelski, Nyquist, and Donskoy, I would still say Vegas has a better top nine. I would disagree with you there, but it would definitely be very, very close. Yeah. But um, I, I think... I mean, it, the proof is in the pudding. I mean, between between NHL playoffs and the World Championship, Mark Stone lit the hockey world on fire. And Hashtag you, unsustainable. <laughs> I don't know. And we'll then, see. obviously, uh, you know, you even looking in the stats a little bit, Max Pacioretty was, was quote-unquote, hurt five times last season and still had 22 goals. I mean, imagine what he's doing if he's healthy playing 82 games. I don't really want to imagine as much as I like Max Pacioretty, but... That that quote unquote second line is was deadly in the playoffs and it's going to be deadly for a long time. Pacioretty obviously got four years coming up. Stone got eight years coming up, and and the top line, you know, the the shark killer line, obviously Marshall, Carlson, Smith. They Vlasic shut them down in the playoffs, but they still have done their damage against the Sharks in the past. And it, the fourth line, I mean, even the fourth line is yeah. Vegas's forwards are honestly really good, and like I said, this mock up I'm looking at doesn't even feature Cody Glass who. I think is a is a sure fit at least to start the season. He'll probably end up going back down to the AHL at some point, but I don't know how you don't start him. I mean, and and, and clearly Vegas values him well. I mean, the the two preseason games with Vegas that I've seen parts of, he's either been with Pacioretty and Riley Smith, or he was with Mark Stone and and March or so. So Vegas obviously wants to see if Cody Glass can hang with the big dogs, and so far he has. Yeah. Well, and you look at this. I mean. VJK or VJK VGK whatever Vegas <laughs> Las Vegas Knights yes Vegas Knights ay 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 uh so the whole thing for me is and that a lot of people don't seem to take into account when they kind of project how the Knights are going to do this year Nate Schmidt missed 20 games you know first 20 and uh on that suspension they went eight, eleven, and one without him, and then went nineteen, four, and three over the next twenty-six games, getting him back. Then, when you add Mark Stone to it, they went eleven, six, and two after getting Stone, including a stretch during that where they went ten and one. So, the big question for me is: Flurry turns thirty-five in November. What happens if he, you know, breaks something? <laughs> yeah that's 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 the big their big wild card because uh flurry obviously hell of a goalie ever since he's gone to vegas but the guys they got behind him it's it's not really a whole lot to write home about i mean malcolm suban has not lived up to where he was drafted there's no doubt about that and you know oscar dansk is a at best, a backup goalie, and Maxim Lagasse, same thing. Best, a backup goalie. I mean, the you know you don't need them to play in the NHL right now. But you're right. If Flurry were to go down again, it's going to be tough sledding. And I don't, as much as they're going to try, I don't think Vegas would be able to outscore the deficiencies. Yeah, 
No, I, I totally hit you. And let's just, again, really quickly, because I actually went and looked this up. During the regular season, the hits that happened at home, they were credited for 1,273 hits at home, averaging 31 hits a game. On the road, that number just basement, 995, averaging 24 hits. Now, the really funny part is during the playoffs, what the hell is the hit counter smoking? <laughs> <laughs> they played three games in the playoffs in Vegas. They were credited with 190 hits, a 63-hit average. 63 <laughs> hits in three games at T-Mobile. Going away, that number plummeted to 127, averaging 32 hits per game, almost half the amount of hits, which makes you think that the one person who needs to stop hitting it is the hit counter. <laughs> because dude is hitting it hard. Hard. Put it okay. down, bro. Just saying. Got that home cooking. Oof. Uh. So, I think that does it for us here. Thanks for checking out our Pacific Division do, preview. Do we want to talk about the Sharks at all? Uh, No, because that's going to be a whole different thing. <laughs> <laughs> But you know what? I'll give you a little tease. I'll give you a little tease just to give you the stats. Uh, Sharks went 48-27-9, good for 101 points. Right now, currently $2.6 million in cap space, which would go down to one point. Five if they signed Marlowe. I'm kidding. Everybody let it go. <laughs> uh, they finished sixth in the power play, 15th in the PK, eighth in goal differential, finished second in the division, second in the conference, yet having the worst save percentage in the NH freaking L, worst save percentage of the 16, 16 teams that advanced. I, and the thing that I want to just talk about, okay, I'll talk about this for a quick second. Goal differential. Sharks were positive, th plus 31 goal differential. That's decent until you realize that Pavelski scored 38 goals. And between Donskoy and Nyquist, there was another 20 goals. That number, the goal differential, doesn't look so good now. That means that the blue line, Bugner, Martin Jones, guys, they need to keep the puck out of the goddamn net. Just saying. But well, I, I think, too, what you have to consider as well is, so Meyer had 30 goals last year. I think he's going to get hit 40. And I LeBanc think he can do that. I think Sorensen can break 20. I think LeBanc can break 25. Uh, all three of those, I agree with you 100%. And also, I mean, I don't want to – I don't, I don't want <laughs> to do, do my <laughs> – I don't want to do my best impression of, uh, of the guy counting hits in Vegas, but, like, if, if – if, Johnny Brodzinski finds a home with Joe Thornton. I mean, who's to say he can't put in 15, honestly? Okay, I'll give you this. Uh, th this is something for us to talk about. To, we'll, we'll talk about two preseason games before we get to what we think of progress. <laughs> did, you, did you watch the mic'd up with Joe Thornton? That Half that video was, Johnny, Johnny, Johnny! <laughs> no, Brodzinski, Johnny, go Johnny, go Johnny, go Johnny! <laughs> Still got it. <laughs> Thornton's what a goof. Um, so in two preseason games, I'll tell you, you know, what I've liked and what I've not liked, or I should say who I've liked and who I haven't liked. Um, right now, uh, not the biggest fan of Mario Ferraro. Really? <laughs> I mean, dude, he's, you know, goes a mile a minute. I, and I totally respect that and everything like that. But, you know, he also took two penalties. Uh, that stuff that he's got to grow out of, and I'm sure he will. I love the fact that he's just all go all the time. So I look forward to seeing that, but uh, I'd like to see a little bit more from him. Uh, it's like, yeah, let me give you like my you know downward projection. It's like Ferraro I'd like to see a little bit more from. Uh, Dylan Gambrell, bro. Like this is your make or break season. Just letting you know. Just letting you know. Um uh Latunov that's another one might mm -hmm. be kind yeah. of like you know 100% yeah uh then I I would like to say 
in the game against Calgary, I called out Manny Weeder and he scored two goals. So <laughs> maybe I need to maybe I need to hit up one of these other guys. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you, Laurel. <laughs> Appreciate it. Um, then it also comes down to you know heading upwards. Then I'm kind of like, I'm really liking Blakefeld. How can you not? Mm-hmm. And you know that the Sharks are in need of wicked help on the right wing, yo. So Blakefeld is a nice piece. Uh, as much as we were sold on uh, Shakovich and Shemulevsky, not seeing a whole lot from them. As, you know, maybe we were oversold a bill of goods. Uh, maybe that's why Blickfeld is looking better in comparison, but liking Blickfeld, liking Brodzinski, uh, who was the other cat? You're taken. Uh, yeah, you're taken. Uh, although I know I'm not pronouncing that. I love hearing Dan Rusinowski say that name. It is so awesome. Um, hmm. but, uh, you know, who, who's your like, imp- oh, and ta- speaking of like not being impressed, Hello, Cornosh. <laughs> wow. And Bebo to a certain extent, but wow. So, I, who, I really, what have I you really liked like, in the preseason after only two games? <laughs> I mean, I like that obviously letting in goals is bad, right? But I like that the Sharks have scored goals, yeah. you know? Because it's like, oh, the Sharks lost all these goals. And it's like, well, no, they could still score. So it's fine. Um, I've really liked Aaron Dell. I thought he played a. I played, thought he played a very good game against Anaheim uh, this past Tuesday, and then uh, Coronash kind of ruined it for him. But you know, it's preseason. Who cares? Um, I, I've really liked Aaron Dell, and I mean, what's there to not like? You know what? Like, it, it. A lot of people were, and myself included, but a lot of people were dumping on the goaltending this past year. But it's like, how often do both of your goalies struggle? Almost never. So, like, I think. You know, I think these guys are still good guys, and 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 like I said, I really liked what I saw from Dell, and he probably felt good about his start too. You know, um, but but I now t- talk to me about the defense specifically, Merkley and Heed. Now start with Tim Heed because I haven't been impressed with Heed, but then can we talk about the rumors that were swirling about Merkley that seemed to OHL insiders? Yeah, you're not that inside, bro. Well, okay, so pause on that for a second because let her rip. O- OHL insiders has gotten more things right than wrong and it's a case of they were given bad information they were given bad information by the team themselves i put that on the team to be totally honest with you like it's pretty it's pretty crappy to flat out lie to somebody who's asking a question i mean granted should they have said nothing probably but still like don't lie because you're just hurting your image and you're hurting the image of the person you're lying to so i don't hold anything against ohl insiders i still think they're a very good follow and like i said they've gotten more right than they've gotten wrong uh, especially pertaining to you know ohl uh trades involving um merkley obviously with the teams that are rumored to be interested but the defense as a whole i mean merkley merkley he he's starting to figure it out from what i've noticed i mean there's still a a lot to unpack there but i still think he's coming around obviously and mario ferraro he struggled a little bit you're right aj he did take those two penalties but i still think he's very clearly wants to be in the nhl this year and unfortunately i don't think it'll happen to start but he wants it, no doubt in my mind. And Tim Heed, uh, I mean, I'm a big fan of Tim Heed, obviously. Shout out, you know, he has a very nice family, very nice person. But uh, I saw him make some really good plays defensively, um, which made me happy, obviously, because that was the biggest knack on him um, was that his defense needed some work. I think he's worked on that a, a lot. I noticed he was on the power play. I'm blanking on who he was on the power play with. Uh, in the game against Anaheim, but I wanted to see a little more aggressiveness from him on the power play because if, if you watched the Barracuda three years ago, you know he's got a booming shot, and I just wanted to see that more. But I can't really, I don't really have a whole lot of complaints about Tim Heed. Of course, you know preseason hockey is preseason hockey, and obviously you're not seeing everything both because it's preseason hockey, but also because preseason hockey streams tend to fail at times. Uh, <laughs> so. Oh, ho, ho, ho. I'm just saying, I didn't say it, but didn't see any problem with Calgary speed (laughs) or their happy hour. Um, But (laughs) 
I, I, I think, though, too, and, and like I said, a guy I called out, Manny Weederer as well, you know, he was drafted in 2016, and guys younger than him are already outperforming him, so it's kind of make or break for him this year, but to see him put up two goals in Calgary, obviously very good to see from his perspective, and I think with preseason, obviously you want to, you know, you want to see guys take the reins and become NHL players, but I think it's be good, too, like, seeing the Barracuda guys just get started and see what they can do maybe against an NHL goalie or something like that, and no Sleepy Mofo, no Brian Boyle, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, d- um, is Jeremy Waugh still on this team? <laughs> uh, he is, but, um, yeah, I, I mean, I don't know. I think he's... Unfortunately, he's another guy who's make or break, but the dude's just had awful luck with injuries. I mean, literally every year since he's been drafted, which was 2015, except for, I want to say, one year, he's had a season-ending injury. Actually, it may have been every year, now that I think about it. All with his knee slash leg, so... I don't know. It was really unfortunate, too, because last year he obviously was playing very well with the Barracuda and then got injured again. So makes you wonder where his development is at. I I mean, he was when we drafted him, he was a very highly touted prospect. Maybe there's still something there. But, bro, as you would say, bro, stay healthy. Yeah. God, that poor fucking guy, man. <laughs> I'm telling you, I feel so bad. Uh, so I think that'll about do it for our kids. Again. Thanks for checking us out. Thanks for watching. Hit the subscribe button right uh, there. And, uh, you know, like us, give us a thumbs up, share the word. Hit us up, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, all the usual subjects. Uh, We're going to be back at you a little bit later in the week. Uh, Let's see. Got to go to a hockey game tomorrow night versus San Jose and Vegas. Then we have Fan Fest. On Sunday, we will be broadcasting live from FanFest uh, sometime between as FanFest ends and the Legends game begins. Uh, we, do, um, we do plan on having, we have one guest that is booked. We're working on a second special guest. We're going to see how that can roll, but next time you can hear us go live, FanFest. Then sometime next week, Brody. Bro, man, open your calendar once in a while. <laughs> I know it's a, it's nothing on him, man. The Oakland Days, what are you going to do? But we will be doing a Sharks Pacific uh, a Sharks preview with Brody Brazil sometime next week. It's probably going to be a little bit later in the week just because of the way the Oakland Athletics schedule is set up right now. So um, there you go. Uh, and since we are live with this, I will take, uh, I've seen a couple questions on here, so we'll do them really quick because we've already been on here forever. Where'd you get that cool shirt? Um, Honestly, uh, Rocket. Rocket hooked me up with this. So that's that's what I know. I don't know where she got it. I think she got it from the super sale that happened at Levi's, but I don't know. Uh, Any other questions about any Pacific teams for me or Jerk? Because that's what this focus is on, and we'll give you about uh, five seconds to get those in. (laughs) Hmm. Uh, Will you guys conflict with the Niners game, though? Uh, I don't care. To me, uh, (laughs) you know, Fan Fest is not a day for football. It's a day for hockey, so I don't care. The one thing that I've heard, though, if you are planning on uh, on attending Fan Fest, is evidently there's some other event that's happening very close and parts of Santa Clara Street are going to be shut down during the, I think, up until like three. Have you heard anything about that? Honestly, v- vaguely, I because, va- you know, downtown San Jose, it seems like every weekend there's some kind of walk going on. Yeah. So, honestly, couldn't tell you. I've heard, vaguely heard that there's something going on, but I couldn't tell you what it's about if it's a... You know, if it's a cause or if it's a group or what it is, but no, all I, I know, heard, <laughs> I all heard, I know is I will I, not be at FanFest. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I will not be watching football either. To to borrow a term from the millennials, football has been canceled. So yeah, football is canceled. Uh, oh, thanks, Anthony. Yeah, Anthony was able to uh, point me in the right direction the other day for the uh, turn up in teal, uh, teal town day at the tank. Nothing confirmed yet, but we are looking into it. The schedule didn't really uh, kind of allow itself to 
uh, you know, for the last season, it was very much kind of like, oh, this is the perfect day for it. This season, not so much. So we'll see. Uh, Cheryl, though, pointing out that the uh, Sharks sent out an email to the season ticket holders. Would have been nice if the other schmoes got one once in a while, too. I'm just saying. <laughs> but if the, yeah, if there's something wrong with Santa Clara Street, I'm just telling you now. Just telling you now. There could be something going on there. So uh, with that, I think it's probably a good time to wrap this up. Thank you guys for checking us out. Don't forget, guys, after dark, I'm not, I, I do believe that Puck Guy is going to have a little after dark for you tomorrow. After San Jose and... That's right, man. Are you guys excited? I'm excited for After Dark. Hey, now. So, uh, I think with that, Jerk, you want to tell where everybody can find you on the social media when they want to stalk you? Yeah, so, uh, we made it, guys. Another summer is over. Uh, <laughs> the leaves are starting to fall. The sky is getting, you know, there's more crepuscular rays coming through, and the rain's coming very soon. So, it, it, it's time. The, the puck is almost down, and we can stop pretending like we care about football and baseball and all these crap. No bachelorette, no none of that. Oh, my Lord. It's hockey time, baby. And uh, if you, too, hate everything except for hockey, who doesn't, uh, you should follow me uh, on Twitter, at hockey underscore jerk. Guys, it, it's only going to get better from here. Uh, I'm just telling you right now. Back we'll to you, see. AJ. Yeah, I am unsure. Yeah, I am unsure. Stay healthy, Eric Carlson. <laughs> Cura. <laughs> yeah. Uh, AJ underscore strong on the Twitter machine, on the Instagram, blah, blah, blah. Uh, don't forget, Teal Town USA, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Those are pretty much the big three. Might be doing a little bit more stuff on Facebook coming up this season, but uh, those are the big three. Share the wealth, if you will. Spread the word. Spread oh. it. Is anybody coming that's watching right now? Is any gonna is anybody gonna be at Fan Fest on Sunday? Just putting no. that out there. If you are, find <laughs> us. We might have a goodie for you. Just AJ you is know. AJ is starting his own tank tailgate. Yes, that's true. <laughs> In fact, I'm this close to making an announcement about an announcement. <laughs> <laughs> You so, too can you too can have a Coors Light and watch the Legends play. That's the tank tailgate. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, so find me on Sunday if you're going to be at Fan Fest or or Eric, and you might end up with a little something something. And uh, you know what? I got to take a page out of Jerk's book. We are going to have an announcement next week. <laughs> <laughs> Look for it. Uh, I think we're, we're targeting Tuesday, maybe late Monday night. But uh, look for Tuesday. Follow us. Instagram, Twitter, YouTube. Share with a friend. Reddit. Yeah. Have our own Reddit now. So uh, if you're on there. Check us out, and uh, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna have a, a couple uh, cool things that are gonna roll. So uh, follow us on all those, and you might end up with a, a goodie or two. So uh, with that, thanks for checking us out. This was the Pacific Division Preview Show here with the Pucknologists. We are out of here, but we do thank you for tuning in. Hit the subscribe button, follow us on the social media, and hey, check out one of our other videos. We have them; they're there. Check out an interview. Listen to a phone call with Kevin LeBay. Good night, everybody. <laughs>